Hello and welcome to the uh, next webinar in the Law Center's webinar series on COVID-19 and issues affecting people experiencing homelessness. Today's webinar uh, will be on sweeps and COVID-19 and we're going to focus on organizing and legal strategies to stop sweeps both now during the pandemic and after the pandemic ends. Next slide please. You've got a great array of panelists. Uh, first, you'll hear from Paul Bowden, Executive Director of the Western Regional Advocacy Project. You'll also hear from Sterling Johnson, an organizer uh, with the Black and Brown Workers Cooperative who is working now in Philadelphia. Uh, Therese Howard, unfortunately, will not be able to join us. She's an organizer with Denver Homeless Out Loud, who unfortunately right now is at a suite that is happening in the city of Denver. Um, so she's obviously unable to attend our webinar to talk about the things that she's doing on the streets right now. Uh, we're also joined by Elisa Della Piana, who's the legal director for the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights of the San Francisco Bay Area. And you are hearing uh, my voice. My name's Tristia Bauman. I'm a senior attorney at the National Law Center on Homelessness and Poverty. I apologize for not being on video. I uh, was not able to manage the technical difficulties. And so I uh, beg, your, beg your patience and forgiveness, but you will hear my voice throughout the webinar. Next slide, please. So before we launch into the substantive discussion, uh, and we do, if we go back to the last slide, please. Just a little bit of uh, webinar housekeeping. So a few things for you to know. One, this webinar is being recorded. It will be posted on our website. You'll have access to the slides as well as to the video and audio recording that you can check back and listen to at your pleasure. Uh, we will reserve time for questions. Uh, we've lengthened the webinar, uh, each individual webinar to a period of 90 minutes so that we can have a uh, robust conversation at the end of the presentations. Uh, we may not take the entire 90 minutes. It's really gonna be a function of how uh, many questions we get and whether or not um, uh, the conversation warrants going that full 90 minutes, but we do appreciate if folks can stick around. Um, and you're also able to ask questions. Do not be shy about asking questions. You'll see your go-to webinar control panel probably on the right hand of your screen. There is a line that says questions, and if you click on the arrow, it will drop down a menu to allow you to type in questions. Um, ask them there. We will get to them after the presentations are complete and we transition into the Q&A session. Uh, there may be some questions that are answered during the time uh, that presenters are speaking. They'll be answered in writing, um, and some of them will save for the uh, verbal Q&A at the end. So please enter them there instead of in the chat box. But feel free to chat with each other during the conversation as well. And be on the lookout in the chat for any links that we may post uh, to some of the materials that we discussed today. Next slide, please. So to get us started, uh, before we transition into our expert speakers who can talk about organizing and legal strategies, I wanna make sure uh, that we're all on the same page and using the same terminology. Uh, my guess is the audience is very familiar, so I'm gonna be going over some you know, familiar territory, um, but this is the operational definition of sweeps that we're using for today's conversation and generally in our advocacy. Um, what are sweeps? We're referring to encampment evictions, and I, I want you to think about them as evictions from housing in the same way that you think about evictions from rental housing. Uh, people who live outside um, consider their tents and temporary structures their homes. They are their homes. That's the home where they live, with their communities, with their families, with their pets, um, and where they keep their possessions, where they have a sense of safety and stability. And that's what's taken from people when they are evicted um, in uh, a process that we refer to as sweeps. We'll talk a little bit about the law um, surrounding sweeps, both how to challenge sweeps, but also the laws governing sweeps. Often, sweeps are conducted without the benefit of some of the basic due process protections that we expect when uh, we're discussing indoor housing. Things like advance notice before being kicked out of your home. Um, and some ability to contest the deprivation of your home. Uh, encampment evictions also um, can refer to uh, 
small encampments. Uh, you know, the larger encampments of uh, you know, 50 or more tents get a lot of press attention. Um, but, but across the country, there are groups of people that are camping um, in, in single tents and any type of displacement um, of those homes is what we're discussing today when we talk about sweeps. Uh, we talked a little bit about how uh, it is forced displacement from a person's outdoor home and their community, and it's usually accompanied by the loss of their property. Sometimes those losses are the result of governments just summarily trashing everything that a person owns, meaning they literally throw it directly into the garbage as though it were a thing without value and without an owner. Uh, they treat it as they would garbage or abandoned property, uh, even though uh, the, these um, types of properties are typically not abandoned um, and often do have uh, significant value and are owned by somebody who um, often is present at the time that the property is being uh, disposed of. The loss of property doesn't always happen um, at the point of the sweep, however, uh, so while it is common practice for uh, either all property to be thrown away or certain types of property to be thrown away um, at the time of the sweep, for example, large items or tents that people live in, um, there are uh, a growing number of cities that engage in uh, storage of property. But even though storage policies are temporary in nature, typically uh, property stored for a period of about 30 to 90 days, and retrieval of property um, is difficult or even impossible in some locations such that the deprivation of property at the time of the sweep, even if stored, amounts to a permanent deprivation of personal property. Uh, we'll talk again uh, about the displacement to nowhere um, as, as I kind of summarize it, but it's important to note that sweeps are often done with no plan at all. Um, for housing or even temporarily sheltering the people who are being displaced from their outdoor homes and shelters. Next slide, please. I'm going to leave it to uh, other experts to talk in more detail, and we'll uh, get into discussions in uh, the Q&A on each of these topics, but I want to highlight a few things up front. Uh, sweeps do not work. They are um, justified by governments on a number of bases. And I'd like to just go through very quickly some of the purported reasons for conducting sweeps and some of the reasons why justifications for sweeps are uh, either pretext for uh, displacing people from public space to hide homelessness from public view or to respond to complaints about um, unhoused people in public spaces or a misguided attempt to force people into systems that do not produce housing, um, all of which perpetuate the problem of homelessness across the country as well as some of the other uh, narrower public interests that sweeps are purported to address like public health and safety concerns. Um, so starting with uh, whether sweeps reduce the number of people living outside, sometimes they're justified as a measure to discourage people from living outside. Sweeps do not reduce the number of people living outside. They displace people from where they are outside, usually to other outdoor locations. Uh, they do not result in people becoming housed by and large or stably housed. It is critical for us to remember that when there is a sweep, it may move it from that particular neighborhood or that particular block but often to the next block, to the next neighborhood, the number of people who lack access to affordable housing remains the same. And therefore, sweeps do not reduce tents or encampments. A, a very common reason for engaging in sweeps activities is a belief that if you take, uh, if you reduce the amount of public space where somebody can erect a tent or other temporary structure to live in, uh, you will reduce the uh, number of tents or uh, concentrated encampments in public space. That is incorrect. Uh, we cover some of this ground in two reports that I'd ask everyone to check out. I'll provide links in the chat. One is Tent City USA, 
released in 2017. The other is Housing Not Handcuffs 2019, released at the end of last year, uh, where we describe how sweeps activities not only fail to reduce the total number of tents outside, at least sustainably reduce, they may temporarily reduce them because all of the tents have, have now gone into the trash, uh, but they do not reduce the total number of tents or encampments and in fact can have the function of creating encampments, uh, especially large encampments as people get swept from certain communities into others um, and uh, are concentrated there. Sweeps do not keep public spaces clean. We often hear, uh, well, what are we supposed to do about the trash and the human waste and all of the other uh, things that accompany uh, people who live outdoors? Um, and it's really important to understand that while it is critical that hygiene and sanitation services be provided to people who live outside for lack of better options, there is a need for trash services, there is a need for access to bathrooms, sweeps, do not provide trash services. They don't provide access to bathrooms. They don't keep people who continue to live outside from generating more trash or from having to go to the bathroom in the future. Sweeps do not keep public space clean. They are a very expensive way of temporarily cleaning a single location. Um, there are far more cost-effective and sustainable ways to keep public spaces clean, and we'll discuss those later. Uh, sweeps do not protect public safety. There have been a number of studies that have looked at uh, the effect of displacing people from communities and areas where they are familiar um, and where they have um, some level of safety uh, to unknown territories um, where they may be likelier to experience violent crime. Uh, that was the result of at least one study out of Denver. Um, and uh, they also do not reduce street crime. In fact, uh, policing groups like the Law Enforcement Action Partnership have come out to condemn sweeps um, because they see that they do not function to protect public safety, to reduce street crime, and in fact, uh, create more vulnerabilities for already vulnerable people living outside um, and can increase the likelihood that they would be victims of crime. Uh, sweeps do not save money. There is no cost savings associated with sweeps activity. It's really important for everyone who pays taxes and within the sound of my voice to understand sweeps waste money. They waste millions of dollars. Uh, Los Angeles, for example, spends over $30 million a year on sweeps, um, but still is the subject of litigation both um, on behalf of plaintiffs who are uh, living outside and subject to sweeps practices that don't address their needs and in fact worsen the crisis and uh, from neighborhoods and business interests who continue to complain about conditions on the streets because sweeps don't work um, and there's a lot of money wasted on that ineffective harmful practice. Uh, finally, uh, I want to just quickly address, since we're part of a COVID-19 series and we are in the midst of a global pandemic, it's very important for us to uh, understand that sweeps do not protect public health. One of the um, most frustrating bases, especially right now, for justifying sweeps is that they're necessary in order to protect public health. Um, but it is clear that sweeps do not do that, and they don't do that in, in a number of ways that I'll just cover uh, quickly here. First, when people lose their property, that means that often they're also losing the protective gear, um, meaning the, the tents of the temporary structures that they use to, to protect themselves from the outdoor elements, or the warm clothing um, that they need uh, during certain months of the year, or the protective clothing that they need. They'll lose medications. Um, they'll lose legal documents that enable them to get medications. They'll lose medical equipment that they rely upon uh, to, uh, to keep breathing at night uh, or to treat their uh, medical conditions. Uh, so from the perspective of a person who has been swept, there is certainly no benefit um, to uh, general public health. And in fact, sweeps can increase the risk that a person living outside will end up in um, an expensive hospital bed um, or other uh, crisis medical facility. They, uh, sweeps also threaten public health uh, by dispersing people 
um, who still have nowhere to discard their food waste and trash, no place to expel their bodily waste, no access to water to clean themselves, to do their laundry, uh, or to keep their belongings otherwise clean to other areas of the city. Um, and certainly during a pandemic where uh, certain types of hygiene practices and uh, social isolation are critical to curbing the spread of the deadly coronavirus, that type of displacement without services um, and with fewer resources to meet basic hygiene and other health needs um, is, is contrary to, um, to sound public health um, and also contrary to public health guidance. So uh, if we can get the next slide, you know, both well, all three, the American Medical Association, the American Public Health Association have condemned criminalization and sweeps in their policy resolutions. And then more recently, um, after the outbreak of the coronavirus pandemic, uh, the U.S. Centers for Disease Control issued guidance, um, including guidance to governments specifically on the issue of outdoor encampments. I've uh, put the entire guidance here. I'm, I'm not asking you to read it through now. You can access the guidance online. You can also access this uh, slide later on the recording. But just a couple things that I want to point out. Governments are urged by the uh, top experts on public health in the country not to displace people from the outdoor locations where they live. And in fact, I'll, I'll just quote here, if individual housing options are not available, individual housing options, not congregate shelter facilities where there's guidance about how congregate shelter facilities also um, carry very serious risks of uh, coronavirus spread. Uh, if individual housing options are not available, allow people who are living unsheltered or in encampments to remain where they are. Very clear guidance. Um, and the CDC even gives uh, some of the rationale for that guidance. Clearing encampments can cause people to disperse throughout the community. We talked about um, that a little bit earlier. And they break connections with service providers. So people who have been treating um, their chronic illnesses um, may not have access to the doctors or other service providers that they need um, to maintain life and health, in addition to all of the other services that are disrupted with sweeps, um, like, for example, access to food services. So that is that is the overview and the context for which I'd like to start our conversation with our experts today. Um, you're going to hear first um, from Paul, who will also be talking about uh, sweeps and a national campaign surrounding sweeps. And then we're going to begin our focus um, on local communities and some of the organizing and legal strategies that have um, been effective in those jurisdictions before transitioning over into Q&A. Thank you all again for joining. And with that, I turn it over to a man who needs no introduction, Paul Bowden at the Western Regional Advocacy Project. All right, so thank you, Tristia. Um, I am uh, the director of the Western Regional Advocacy Project, which is an organization that was created by a bunch of local community organizing groups, most of whom um, just felt that the, the issues that we were seeing every day at the front door and on our street outreach weren't weren't what we were feeling and it wasn't the energy we were getting as things would get to the state level or the national level a lot of that local passion the fact that it's your brothers and sisters it's not them um the fact that a lot of us that come from the street um that doesn't define who we are as human beings we're human rights warriors and we're fighting for justice for all people we just happen to have been unhoused at different points and times in our life and our community is uh, is everybody in that community, not this group versus that group versus this group. The way that we treat poverty and racism in this country is what it manifested homelessness in the first place. And so we always bring things back to that core element. It, we, the first project we did, because our feeling was, Lord knows poor people don't need another coalition, so if you're gonna form a coalition, you better have a damn good reason for forming it in the first place. And the first voice that we put out was our research and, and report and use of artwork in, in everything we do um, called Without Housing. And it was a very simple, 
very direct. What happened right before 1982 when we started opening freaking shelters again across the country? What happened was Reaganomics and the Reagan revolution and the, the in, institutionalization of neoliberalism into all of our fabric. Our, we started privatizing our military, our schools, our, our public parks, and sure as hell, we went for subsidizing housing when it's a commodity. That's the mortgage interest tax write-offs and all those programs, and that's $140 billion a year, and wiping out affordable housing funding for poor people. That wasn't based on cost, because we wipe, we spend a hell of a lot more subsidizing housing to do today than we ever did. It was based on priorities. It was based on if it's capital, if it's commodified, it's economic stimulus and it's good for America. And we're sure as hell seeing that in the COVID situation now where communities are pitted against each other to bid for PPEs. Well, in the homelessness arena, communities have been pitting, pitted against each other, writing applications to, to get funded by HUD in the McKinney process. And every year, city after cities don't get federal funding for affordable for how homeless programs and continue to see the decimation with Hope 6 and RAD and all of the programs that have come down in addition to the funding cuts that are putting community members out in the freaking street. And what happens is we then get criminalized we then get arrested and get called a health hazard and get swept. You sweep trash. You don't sweep fucking human beings. That's just not how you're supposed to be addressing the human needs of people that live in your community. So, Melissa, if you could click over the stuff so I can do the slide. All right, are people seeing the slide? Hello. I got this fancy slideshow here, man. Come on. No, all right. Well, I'll just look at it myself and tell you guys about it. Um, what we did when we had the Without Housing Report and we had that campaign and, and we actually were able to take charts and turn them into posters and make them interesting so people would put it on their walls was we coupled that with over 1,600 street outreaches to community members in 12 cities and seven states asking about their interactions with the police. And we found universally across the board the top three were sleeping, sitting, and standing still. That Those were the top three criminal offenses that people were identifying in terms of, you know, their interactions with the cops and with the private security. Um, this is just an example of how we, of how we incorporate artwork into our messaging. Um, but, and the shit ain't doing it. Um, we, we then from doing that outreach, we wrote a bill, the right to rest act that would decriminalize the activities of sitting, sleeping, laying down, eating and standing still in public spaces. Sounds crazy that you would even need to do that. But we, we did some historical analysis and discovered going back to the ugly laws and going back to Basarero Treaty and Japanese American Exclusion Act and sundown towns and Antioche laws that this country has a long history of using the time, place and manner restrictions that local governments can impose and criminalizing segments of the community that the local power establishment has decided we don't want in our neighborhood. We don't want in our city. So we're going to take laws like standing still, like sitting down, like sleeping, that everybody does. Every single person does those things. And we're going to criminalize those that we choose to and when they do it in order to make sure that people know that they need to get the hell out of town. Um, we need to understand sweeps in that context because it's part of the systemic racism and the systemic classism that exists in this country. 
And if we're really going to talk about living up to the standard of defunding the police and rethinking how we do policing, we need to be all inclusive. And, you know, homeless people may be today's target. We know damn well we weren't the first targets of this kind of aggressive discriminatory policing. And we know we're not going to be the last targets until we overturn the, the power that local governments have. And our feeling is very strong that with a long history of racist and classist and discriminatory policing, that local governments have lost their, their power to do this, that they have abused it to the point where they should no longer have it. And that's why we wrote state legislation in order to take that power away from them when they enforce these laws, when they're being committed in a non-obstructive manner. So that's how we frame the campaign. And, and this is the documentation from, <clears throat> from the street outreach that we did. And when I'm talking 82, 77, 75%, that's across the board. Understand that's in over 12 cities and in over seven states. That's not one community being mean. When they talk about the meanest cities or they talk about who's doing it right, this is across the board that these laws are being used and being used against people because of their housing status. Um, this is a summary of the Right to Rest Act, and this stuff is all on the website. It's all free. You can download it and use it to your heart's content, including the artwork. But it's it's just the right to be able to move freely and be in a space and, and, and to be free of harassment, which is not too much to ask. So, as you know, we ran a bill three times in each of in, in Colorado, Oregon, and California, the League of Cities, the Police Association, the Sheriff's Department, and especially the Business Improvement Districts, League of Cities and the Business Improvement Districts being the biggest. They were organizing against our bill before we could even get it introduced. That's how fearful they are. That's how much the League of Cities doesn't want to lose control over this issue. They want to be able to use their police forces to remove the presence of homeless people so that they can say it's housing first or so HUD can say they give a shit about homelessness and about homeless people. You know, HUD created the problem when they wiped out affordable housing. HHS created the problem when they wiped out residential treatment. And yet we're the ones that go to jail and they call these laws tools in their toolbox. How? how do you if you're thinking about laws that discriminate against people's presence as a tool in your toolbox clearly you're using it to implement a bigger plan and it has to be fought at that level and with that level of understanding this is part of a plan to, to bring neoliberalism full force into the united states we tested it in south america we tested it in central america and now we're implementing it here and that really is the crux of the Reagan revolution. And it's gonna, and we see federal forces in local communities right now, even though everybody's saying they don't want them there, the federal government's bringing them there. So when they wanna use the awesome power of the federal government for their corrupt purposes, they have no problem finding the resources and being able to implement their strategies. But when we want to see people treated as human beings, nobody can afford it. And instead of the Homes for All Act, we're going to go and try to get more vouchers. That's ridiculous. Housing should be a human right. And it should be something that we're all entitled to. And if we can afford home ownership subsidies, we can sure as hell afford housing opportunities for the poorest people in our communities. And that requires us to be on the front lines fighting alongside the, the brothers and sisters that are being swept off of our streets. That requires having a street connection in everything you're doing. These, th this isn't about, well, they came to the meeting. No, you need to go to them. You need to be hanging out with them. You need to be seeing them as really your community, where you live, part of who you are, and bringing all of the vast resources that, you know, lawyers, artists, academics, uh, you know, whatever, organizers, like bringing all of those resources to bear because that combined skill set makes us all 10 times smarter than we are by ourselves or by a single issue uh, addressing shit. Um, and so I will turn it over to Tristia.
Um, and if you have any questions, I'll answer them later. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Can folks hear me? Yes. Great. Uh, thank you very much for that, Paul. Uh, we are going to transition over to Sterling, who will uh, describe for us some of what's happening uh, surrounding suites in the city of Philadelphia. Thank you very much, Sterling, for joining us. Hey. Thank you, Justia, and thank you, Paul, for providing that great overview. Um, so I'm Sterling Johnson. Uh, I'm an organizer with the Black and Brown Workers Cooperative. Uh, also a housing lawyer in the city of Philadelphia. Um, so, and I, I've been in the city of Philadelphia for about seven years. Uh, so, and I've been in the housing realm, but also in the harm reduction realm. So I had um, introductions to different parts of being in court and supporting people that are experiencing evictions uh, from from structures, um, judicial structures, but also uh, been interfering with evictions from structures that people make on their own, as Paul alluded to. So. Um, we, uh, the, the main thing that I'm here to talk about is the fact that uh, we have a protest encampment that is located um, in between City Hall and the Philadelphia Art Museum in a very public place that is, that, that is uh, meant to protest the fact that there is no permanent housing for people in the city of Philadelphia uh, that are experiencing homelessness. Um, or they are provided inadequate housing for them. So I, I am going to just kind of give you more of the background um, because uh, people often start at that, at that protest encampment. However, uh, it, what we have here is the culmination of years of advocacy. <laughs> so it's it's usually as, as you can imagine, it did not start. We, we did not just decide to uh, liberate uh, a, a very important space to the city of Philadelphia. That was not not the initial decision. So uh, I've been involved uh, with, uh, with uh, an area called Kensington in Philadelphia, where uh, it is the traditional place where people um, are buying a lot of opioids. Uh, there was a, there were four massive encampments there. Uh, our strategy there about two years ago was to uh, witness them um, and to force them to uh, the city to introduce um, pathways to housing, housing, housing first uh, slots for people, and then also uh, really not have police involved, involvement at all. And we made it very public. That is where we were, uh, and also with the help of with the National Law Center <laughs> and Eric Tars, uh, kind of figuring out how to uh, kind of push the city towards a, an, uh, a softer way of, of dealing with encampments. Um, and that is what happens with, with the larger encampments. What still happens with the smaller encampments is the, is the, um, is the random uh, police uh, stealing, your, uh, stealing your goods and placing them in the trash. So um, that is something we still have to work on. Uh, and then when we come, that was a large period of time, probably over um, say around 15 to 16 months in 2017, 2018 is when that was happening. Uh, I'm going to push us up to January of this year is when there was a, there seemed to be a concerted effort to remove all of the individuals that were experiencing homelessness from the center city district of, of our city. Um, and that was coinciding with the uh, opening of a new mall called the Fashion District, um, and as well as, uh, it, uh, I guess, the new opening of uh, a convenience store, called, what we call Wawa's here uh, in Philadelphia. It's just a, an 11 e type of place, but yeah, it's called Wawa. Um, so they're opening several of those. So um, people have had, have traditionally had encampments in the, in the center of the city. They have worked very well with 
uh, neighbors to move during the middle of the day, uh, to uh, create space for people walking through. This is a decades long relationship that people that are in house have had with, with the residents and, and business owners in, in the center of Philadelphia. Um, we, we really believe that it is the business interests and the, the tourism interests that have, uh, that are forcing the city to then remove the people from there. Uh, the first one happened in January 6th uh, of the, early this year. Uh, our strategy has been to witness them, tape them, interfere with them. Um, also, you know, on our social media, I let people know that this is happening. Uh, they often um, are, are kind of stopped for a while, but then we can't stay there the whole time. So it's, um, you know, it's, it becomes this this thing where we really need um, like a larger strategy. Um, so we knew that we saw them doing this, uh, this, this campaign against all of the individuals in the center of the city. Uh, a lot of those, I would say almost all of those individuals happen, happen to be black too, which is a, a very important uh, fact here. Uh, the amount of discrimination and segregation that is in the city of Philadelphia is very significant. Um, so uh, in February, we met with the city of Philadelphia to figure out um, what they were going to do uh, to support the people here. Uh, they said that they were going to continue to do sweeps. Um, they were going to continue to harass people. Um, and have uh, police uh, stationed outside of them, outside of those uh, encampments that they had cleared. Um, and, and so that's when we decided that we really needed a different strategy. Um, so it was basically on, on that day when we decided that we're going to have to have two fronts. So the first front would be interfering in the homeless sweeps, which uh, has to be done. Um, I, I say people that don't want to do that, it's like there has to be an engagement around the actual people doing the sweeps, but also um, you have to understand um, media and it, it has to be taped. It cannot be done in darkness. So our strategy has always been to tape every single thing. Uh, secondly, um, we have a significant history of uh, public housing takeovers in the city of Philadelphia. We have many, many vacant, we have thousands, tens of thousands of vacant properties owned by city of Philadelphia, the re redevelopment agency, uh, the housing authority, which the mayor has control over, and then also private developers that um, are just waiting on properties to uh, uh, sell them to high, the highest bidder. Uh, I was like to say, I, I currently live in a space that's about to be gentrified and I have six empty properties around me. Um, it's it's really quite quite disturbing what what outside development will do to a neighborhood uh, in terms of creating the blight themselves and intentionally creating that space for um, gun violence to happen for and all sorts of other things that uh, go along with uh, neglect and abuse. So um, to go from there, um, that's when we started <laughs> do some of the responsible things around scouting the houses assisting people into the houses um that that's a large large process i'm not going to go into it uh because you have to make the housing safe um clearly some of the houses are viable but but they're not not all of them um and the whole point is that there was a a need to um uh, just kind of liberate these these properties that had been sitting vacant in neighborhoods and we will talk to the neighbors they're also very happy that somebody is there uh, um, and that this has been a part of our strategy in terms of the upper, the, the, the need to have permanent housing. So these, and these are all houses that were going to be auctioned off to private development. So it's very important to sit in the spaces that are about to be sold off to private developers. So um, we can, the, the months go on and um, really the, the first, on the first day that there was a stay-at-home order in Philadelphia, uh, the city continued to go forward with their uh, with their sweeps. They um, we we informed them of of the guidelines. They seemed to be unbothered by them. Um, again, we would interfere with them uh, in some of the, in the richer neighborhoods uh, as well. Um, we were able to force 
uh, in terms of what we would call wins or, or victories, um, when, when there was a when there was the money for FEMA to open up hotels, we, we've been able to push the city to open uh, open uh, prevention hotels for people that are um, that are at risk of of COVID. So we are that was able to happen when there was a, about 150 people staying at the airport, and we uh, were able to force that just by bringing it to light and, and talking to people there. Uh, our organizing is mostly is harm reduction organizing. Uh, that is about uh, talking to just talking to individuals, hanging out, going down there. Um, I've been doing this for years, so I end up knowing a lot of people. I'm uh, go. I'm also part of ACT UP Philadelphia, so I a lot of people that are unhoused are part of ACT UP. So it's just giving out syringes, uh, giving out uh, just wraps, stuff, um, any any kind of pipe, any sort of uh, thing that shows that like we care. It doesn't really matter if you're a drug user or not um we're there to support people so that's been the most important like part of part of uh, our work in terms of organizing um and i'm gonna just speed up and go to the the protest encampment now where you can understand that we saw that this wasn't really working we really, we really weren't getting to where we needed to be uh so we decided the thing that we needed to do was figure out how many houses we wanted uh make sure that we we're going to uh you know, kind of claim those, but simultaneously we needed to have a huge public action that was going to bring attention. So, and that's where we decided to sit on the uh, this one spot that's really right in front of the art museum, Philadelphia Art Museum, right where the Rocky statue is, etc., where there's lots of tourists go. Our, we're right across from the Rodin Museum, the Thinker. So it's it's a very, um, very. Uh, and rich neighborhood. Also, we're right in front of some uh, apartment buildings where uh, about it's about five thousand a month for them, and we're we're right by a Whole Foods, which is very convenient for me. Uh, so I can get as much kombucha as I want. So it's great. Um, so um, that that was that was why why we settled there. And, and of course, there we you know one of some of the strategies are that is the fact that like i have been involved with the city in uh, many different ways i do know uh we know our district attorney larry krasner who's a progressive prosecutor um didn't really believe in that that much but he is much better than many others um so we can have contact with him have contact with the department of health contact with the mayor's office uh it was very um it was very easy for them to contact me specifically about like what we are doing <laughs> and then for me to contact them to let them know that these are our demands and you know we're not leaving until they're met so and the demands happen to be around the transfer of the property properties into a community land trust uh that is what we are looking for um community land trusts are pretty common ideas uh what we are looking for is a very specific one that involves Supporting people that are no and low income, um, that, that, those are the people that cannot find a space in the city of Philadelphia. Um, the seven people that are earning between seven hundred and fifty and a thousand a month. We know that about um, in some areas, some zip codes, uh, like the median income is about ten thousand for people. So those are those are the numbers that we're uh, that we're thinking about, and those are the those are the people that we are supporting. Uh, and in, or in our in community with. So another issue was getting them to stop selling off all their properties to private developers. And in Philadelphia, we also have this thing called councilmanic prerogative where the councilman just use uh, all the land that's in the land bank, uh, basically as as just their, um, you know, just to repay debts. So it's really quite disgusting what they are engaged in. Um, we had uh, other demands are a sanctioned encampment, uh, it's kind of tiny houses, some temporary housing for people, um, figuring, up, figuring out what accountability looks like for all the cops and, and city outreach workers and any any worker that engages with the with the, uh, with the person that's unhoused. Um, those, are the, those, those are the things, it was really focused on what we've heard all along, which is people want to be, uh, they want permanent housing, that's all they want they want um you know if they if they do have to have temporary housing it should lead directly to um 
like a permanent housing solution, but that temporary housing must be open. You must be, it must be, you must be able to come and go and it must be acceptable to, to you. Uh, and then lastly, people just want to be treated with respect and they don't want to be lied to. Uh, they don't want to have their, um, at least from what I've heard, they don't want to have their social security number taken over and over again uh, to then, to no avail, to for, for nothing really, um, to still be on the street. So those are some of the, the things that, and that we have. So we have, the way that we set it up is that it's really a no cop zone. We said that no cops can be allowed, are allowed to be in there. No outreach workers are allowed to come in as well. Um, they were allowed to talk to people and people didn't want anything that they wanted unless it was permanent housing. They had no permanent housing. So um, all they had was a referral to a shelter and that was not what people wanted. Um, from there, we've begun talks with the city. I will say that they did not, they were not going anywhere for about, for a few weeks. Um, uh, they offered many things. They offered, um, I mean, honestly, they offered, they opened another hotel, which was helpful. Um, they are doing tiny houses, but that was basically it. Um, I will say they were not, they were not going to move based on the things that we were doing. Um, we had some very smart people uh, that were able to um, also take part of our camp and they moved it up to the housing authority and then they, they really ramped it up. They had to escalate it. Um, that is where they they sat, they again, sat on a space that was about to be developed into a supermarket. And that is when they again got more attention. Um, they, um, the, then the, the real issue is they would not talk about the permanent housing. Uh, they would not. Um, so we made, even after we sat on their housing authority lands and it brought uh, another person, kind of the housing authority into this, um, they had to respond. Uh, they would not. So that is when we cut off negotiations and we had to just go dark. And when we went dark, uh, that is when the city uh, then basically give us five days before we we're going to be evicted. So um, that is when that was that was on the 17th. I can tell you, I mean, clearly we succeeded uh, because it's 12 days after the 17th and our our encampment still exists. Uh, you know, part of that was direct actions uh, that we, we just go to people's houses uh, and protest and yell at them. We I make sure to uh, um, you know, be in contact with the with individuals and let them know that you know we need you to have. This is our formal request for um, for sanitation and hygiene and in, in accordance with the CDC guidelines that you are not following. You are not now responsible for that. Somebody did get norovirus in our in our in our encampment, and I wanted them wanted to let them know that they would be responsible if that person was um, you know put in the community and then also hurt others. Um, some of the things that. Um, that, that I did were just around um, just letting them know like what the law is uh, around Mart about Martin v. Boise. Um, also, um, we've also been using the news a lot to accuse them of argue of not arguing in good faith. Um, we know the, specifically that the mayor has the ability to remove all uh, half half of the um, the housing authorities board. So um, it was really important to lay that out and say that you have not been arguing good faith and and we we will be talking to uh, you know the everybody about it so um you know and lastly um you know it is it, we have these these things of there's an uprising going on there is a a um you know global pandemic um we are a city that is very segregated and it just didn't look that great if it wasn't going to look that great for the mayor, if he had another time where um, he, uh, the police were going to be bashing in the heads of of uh, people that were unhoused and women and and disabled people, and I'm disabled, and it's like I, I we're all ready to go, um, and um, we really brought in Black Lives Matter as well, and everybody slept there the night before, um, but was planning on sleeping there the night before um, until basically they decided to postpone the eviction and to finally talk to us on the grounds that we wanted to talk to them. Um, so, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna wrap that up. Uh, I just wanted to give a little bit of those details. Um, I will say, you know, 
we we're at the point where they have committed to a pilot community land trust. Um, the, the mayor has committed to that, uh, and they, that will involve us. But this is it was it has not been easy. It has not been we have not been um, like none of this has been has been very clear. There's been no clear road. Uh, it has just been a lot of a lot of a lot of fighting, a lot of fighting and, and believing in in what we want. And 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 when they said things like, oh, there was a stabbing there, we you know we said things like, yes, violence sometimes erupts when people don't have the things they need. Um, when they talked about overdoses, we, we we know well, yes, there's lots of Narcan. Uh, there's lots of people using drugs here. Um, people living together make sure people don't die here. So um, so it's very important to let people to stand true by all the things around uh uh around the reality of the site and and to stay stay by it and and uh we, we don't we don't pretend like it's a it's a magical heavenly place it it's a place with with lots of issues just like the world is full of lots of issues and and we take it we take those those seriously and try to mitigate and harm do harm reduction on each of them so um i'm gonna stop talking um i just wanted to just give that a little bit of overview overview of, of the and little get into the the details of of like what one of these campaigns has uh has looked like and felt like over the last i guess about it was seven months yeah seven months so uh thank you very much thank you sterling <laughs> that was that was great um gave us a lot of insight into the organizing strategies that you've been using in philly you and others have been using in philly um and it's uh, excellent to hear that you are making progress. Um, a number of questions have poured in for you, um, and I'm eager to get to those when we get to the Q&A session. Um, I will mention that we were uh, supposed to hear from Therese Howard of Denver Homeless Out Loud, but unfortunately, mm -hmm. the city of Denver continues to engage in sweeps activity, and Therese was called away um, to a sweep this morning, um, and so she is not able to join us. I, I wanted to go over very quickly uh, a brief overview as we transition from organizing strategies to legal strategies, and we'll hear from Elisa Della Piana about that. Um, but just to give everyone a very brief orientation on uh, essentially sweeps in the law. Um, as I mentioned before, we have a 10 city USA report that looks at a set of 187 cities that the law center has tracked since 2006. Um, in those cities, we've looked at the existence um, and the growing prevalence of laws that punish certain life-sustaining activities, like, for example, sleeping outside or, or camping outside, um, which can mean just sleeping outside or erecting some kind of a shelter around yourself while you do that. Um, and of those 187 cities, we looked at any policies, formal policies governing how sweeps are conducted. And what we found um, I think it was shocking even to us. There are very few policies regulating how governments displace communities of people from public space, uh, how they treat their property, and what happens post-displacement. So what we found is that 11% of cities, uh, at least in 2017, when we last did this uh, environmental scan, only 11% required any advance notice at all. That advance notice could be as little as 24 hours, um, but even that minimal protection um, is only available as a formal policy in 11% of, of the cities across the country that we've studied. Um, and at that same percentage um, is uh, also, uh, also requires some form of property storage. We talked about how property storage may be the equivalent of permanent property deprivation because of storage policies and how they function as a practical matter. Um, but typically, when you have a property storage policy, property will be stored, um, and usually only certain types of property, and usually property stored only at the discretion of governmental employees. But the property that is stored is usually stored for a maximum of, of 30 to uh, 90 days. Um, a, a, an even smaller percentage of cities with formal policies require even an offer of alternative housing or congregate shelter. Um, so that means um, really a, a pretty minimal requirement, typically just a, you know, a piece of paper or a direction to a local services infrastructure. Um, no requirement, even among this 3%, that people actually be connected with some alternative to replace the shelter that they've lost. Um, and so, you know, there's just not a lot of law governing sweeps. Um, there is a growing body of law uh, surrounding challenges to sweeps policies and practices. Um, and uh, you'll hear more about that from Elisa, a quick 
quick primer. Um, we all have a Fourth Amendment uh, possessory interest in our property. We also have um, a right to uh, protection uh, not only against unreasonable seizures, but also unreasonable searches of our tents and, and property. Um, the way that the privacy interest um, plays out on the ground and in the courts really varies across jurisdictions. Um, but when governments are wholesale seizing property um, without any advance notice, without any sort of uh, process for contesting the deprivation of that uh, property deprivation, um, and uh, they're taking critical property, um, it very well may be that there's a Fourth Amendment and 14th due process um, violation that's occurring as as a part of that sweeps practice. Um, there have been a number of cases like uh, Levan, the city of Los Angeles, for example, that have um, established those principles. You can read more about the cases and the claims in our Housing Not Handcuffs 2019 report available on our website. We also have a Housing Not Handcuffs litigation manual uh, that goes into the claims in a little bit more detail and also includes case summaries of other sweeps cases. Um, aside from the property claims, some of the due, uh, procedural due process uh, claims, there also um, may be uh, uh, substantive due process claims. For example, if people are being affirmatively displaced to uh, more dangerous settings and it's known or obvious that those uh, new settings create serious risks of bodily harm, there may be uh, substantive due process claims under the 14th Amendment, um, often referred to as state-created danger claims. Uh, to the extent that enforcement is part of the sweeps process, and by that I mean that they're issuing tickets or making arrests for um, for for being in a camp, um, there may be Eighth Amendment claims. Uh, Martin v. City of Boise looked at how the Cruel and Unusual Punishment Clause applies to uh, criminal punishments, um, and uh, recently Blake v. City of Grants Pass uh, clarified um, that the Eighth Amendment and Martin's holding extend also to civil punishments, um, meaning tickets for uh, that same activity. And also uh, the Blake v. Grants Pass case um, uh, resulted in an order um, that the tickets for camping outside when there is no other place to be um, are excessive fines also under the Eighth Amendment. There may be um, Americans with Disabilities Act claims um, because of the discriminatory, discriminatory impact that sweeps practices have on people with disabilities. Um, and then there's also uh, some state law claims. I wanna give a, a quick shout out to a success that I think really uh, uh, demonstrates well the power of organizing and law working in concert with one another. Um, one of the uh, members of the House Keys Not Sweets campaign that you heard Paul talk about um, is Sacramento Services Not Sweets Coalition, and that includes groups like SHOCK, Sacramento Homeless Organizing Committee, as well as the Sacramento Homeless Union. Um, and organizers got together um, to put pressure on the county of Sacramento to issue uh, public health orders limiting when sweeps can occur and requiring uh, certain uh, things of the county and city uh, should a sweep occur, um, like, for example, providing alternatives to people who are displaced. Um, the organizing resulted in a very strong order from the Sacramento County Health Officer that was issued on May 22nd, 2020. Um, but within 48 hours of that, the city um, engaged in a sweep in violation and did so in violation of that health order. So the Sacramento Homeless Union filed a petition for a writ of mandate arguing um, that the sweep violated a mandatory governmental duty. And that's the duty that was established under the county health order that that organizers helped to get in place. Um, and they were successful in getting, um, uh, not only defeating a standing argument showing that they had a claim, but were successful in getting relief um, and an order from the court requiring that the city comply with that um, public health order. Um, so just you know, a great example of how uh, Sacramento Homeless Union and others um, have organized together and then used the power of the law to make those organizing wins meaningful in the courts as well. Um, and with that, I will uh, turn it over to another person who has uh, a lot of W's under her belt um, and has been uh, working with organizers in the San Francisco Bay Area for years. Thank you so much for joining us, Elisa. Yeah, happy to be here. 
And thanks for the, I mean, I feel like I have to say very little at this point. Everyone else has done such an incredible job, both laying the groundwork and giving examples of how this all plays out on the ground. Um, but I will give three quick examples of court cases and litigation. Um, sorry, I'm. we're having a, a plumbing uh, situation at my house, and so there might be a little bit of traffic, of our apartment, there, a little bit of traffic in and out, which is, it's what it is what it is. Um, I think you already saw my my 13 year old with his pink hair come try to get on camera. So um, thank you for your everyone's uh, patience. Um, so I'll give three quick examples about um, uh, cases and legal efforts where we really partnered with organizers on the ground and had some success. The first um, is actually from. 20 years ago, but it remains a, a really important experience to me. I was a law student and worked with the Coalition on Homelessness in San Francisco. Paul was still there at the time. Um, uh, and there were there was a shelter that closed and in the closing, uh, the shelter just decided to destroy the remaining belongings of people who hadn't been there on the final night of the shelter. And, um, and people, residents, there were at least, 30 people who had lost stuff, had it destroyed at the end, and they came together through the Coalition on Homelessness, and um, we actually helped them file um, 30 individual small claims cases, but we, uh, because of organizing, were able to do it together, and so um, everyone's case was heard on the same morning in small claims court. And so um, it was a, actually a really powerful experience because I mean, as the cases I'm going to talk about later are class actions and have taken three or four years, but small claims is a fairly short process and people, um, uh, you know, one after the other came and testified about what had happened to them, what they lost, um, how much they needed it, and they were there to cheer each other on. Um, they were there to do media afterwards at a press conference, and um, and the judge was moved in a very different way than he would have been um, if it had just been one person um, or a couple people, uh, and and granted pretty significant relief um, as allowed under small claims law. Um, uh, in monetary damages for each of the people. Um, so that was a good example of what is possible when people come together. Um, and of course, an example of just the total disregard for what people, I mean, people need. Um, you would think that shelter workers would realize uh, uh, that people needed these things, but um, the second example uh, was a class action suit out of Fresno. The city of Fresno was taking and destroying bulldozing encampments and, um, you know, the only place to go in Fresno at the time, let alone, I mean, there was hardly any permanent housing, hardly any affordable housing, um, but also the, the only shelters at the time were privately run. And so you had a choice to go to the mission uh, and you had to kneel for 30 minutes in prayer before you were even allowed in for your bed. Or, or food, um, and there weren't, and there still weren't enough spots. So, um, and the city was was just absolutely destroying um, people's tents over and over again. And you know, I, as a lawyer, we had, I worked on all these cases with a big group of both lawyers and organizers and 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 folks directly impacted. As a lawyer, it was like, we have these tools. It's unconstitutional what's happening. We'll take it into court. And that's just really, you know, in the future, we'll take something into court. In the future, we might be able to get you money. It's really useless in the moment. Uh, it doesn't stop the bulldozers. And so um, us, we had the chance to work with folks on the ground, organizers who had been deeply in the community, including um, folks working on the street newspaper and the Catholic worker and people who had been homeless and 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 came back to help organize their communities. And those were the folks who knew, you know, heard when crews were coming. Those are the folks who stood in front of the bulldozers and saved. There was one instance where there was someone who was very, you know, dead asleep in a tent um, 
when the bulldozer came and only because only because someone stood in front of the bulldozer did was there time for that person to wake up and realize what was happening before they actually got um i mean killed uh is what would have happened if the bulldozer had come through um and uh and so, and all of that, I mean, if you're thinking at, about this from a lawyer's perspective, it's also, you have that power of people coming together to, to fight what's happening in the moment. And you also have, that meant that there were lots of photographs and videos and documentation of what was happening so that we could show the court and show the media um, how truly um, abusive this was in, in addition to unconstitutional. Um, like I said, that was a three and a half year effort. We ended with um, a multi-million dollar damages award and a statewide and a change in policy, both in the city of Fresno and statewide. Um, the statewide agency Caltrans was involved. Um, and, and an example of what happens when you um, don't organize for a while or don't uh, pay attention yeah. for a while. As soon as the federal injunction was over, Caltrans went back to taking and destroying people's belongings without notice, um, just right after, right as soon as it was possible. And so four years ago, we sued Caltrans again. Um, and this time worked with uh, folks in Oakland, Berkeley, and Emeryville, uh, here in the East Bay in, in Northern California um to to pull together another class action suit that would what we were asking for was a permanent injunction against caltrans this is actually the third time that they had been sued for the same exact unconstitutional um, behavior um and uh you know we we settled the case after many years of litigation uh and were able to get a, a strong i mean you know, as far as the law goes, you know, requirements of notice and storing property and um, uh, uh, you know, some sort of um, recognition that people can stay uh, where they are instead of be moved out. Um, so I think we, um, yeah permanent signs that say when crews can come and if they don't come at that time they can't come until the next time um just a little bit of a an acknowledgement that people are going to be there and that they have a right to be there um in the in the procedures that we built into the settlement um and again that was we settled along the lines of and and many multi-million dollar settlement again for people who lost property we're still working hard on getting people claims so they can get money out of that pot um but and that doesn't um i mean it's sort of like as far as the law would go what we thought we could get from a court but um it it wouldn't have stopped the sweeps altogether uh but we organizers on the ground with where do we go Berkeley and um, Berkeley Cop Watch and uh, uh, a lot of other folks in Oakland um, pulled together a campaign uh, on media and social media and um, and and said they weren't leaving campsites and ended up being able to negotiate separately with Caltrans to acknowledge that certain encampments we're going to be permanent in a more official way and not send crews at all and provide bathrooms and um, uh, trash pickups uh, in a way that was uh, separate and more than what we were able to accomplish in the lawsuit. It was working sort of hand in hand, communicating with those folks um, that we were able to bring our leverage points together and say like, what can we accomplish in the suit? What can we accomplish with organizing and media and how do we collectively get the most that we can um, for folks on the ground uh, to stop this just stop uh, the sweeps as much as possible so those are our experiences i don't know i'm always happy to answer sort of technical legal questions um, or whatever folks have if there's something in the q a but i mostly wanted to say that you know we, i'm a lawyer i often have uh, a hammer, but um, it's there's no reason to do this work without the whole toolbox, and and it's a lot less fun to uh, uh, litigate a case unless you're really um, 
working with the folks who have, are on the ground, have experienced this directly. You just can't um, walk into a court and think that you can represent um, what it's like to have a to have everything you own taken from you and destroyed um, unless you've got folks who have really lived it um, who are on your team uh, and can and can tell you exactly what needs to happen uh, in terms of change. So ha happy to be on this panel with all of these incredible folks. Thanks for having me. Thank you, Alisa. Um, we're going to transition into Q&A for the remainder of our time. Uh, I, I wanted to start with um, something that you ended with, Alisa. There's one of the frustrations that I think uh, attorneys and organizers and certainly people experiencing homelessness have is that there's a, there's a disconnect between the legal tools available to us and the remedies that people actually want. Um, you know, one of the things that the Law Center has um, written about in an article, for example, that was published in the Columbia Human Rights Law Review is that, you know, courts are empowered in our view to order remedies and equity, order housing, because ultimately um, an, uh, stopping an unreasonable search and seizure in one context does not stop sweeps, doesn't stop even the, uh, the deprivation of property, just um, the unreasonable deprivation of property um, from the perspective of a court. Um, so how, how can we navigate the tension between the legal arguments that can secure wins and the actual remedies needed to address the harms that people suffer living outside? And that's, that's really for the whole panel. Um, but Elise, I think you probably have some thoughts about that and have thought about that over time. Yeah, I mean, I I think it's imperfect. But what I've I mean, I've got sort of three thoughts. One is that um, as lawyers, there's always the like, okay, we we feel like these are our strongest arguments. These are the safest arguments. But I think we should also always be including the more creative ones um, in addition, because we have to be pushing the envelope. Um, towards a right to housing, towards um, the kinds of remedies that we know are needed. And I think the first step is asking and, and for those things and um, substantiating those asks in addition to the claims that we know are more likely to succeed. Um, uh, so I think we gotta be pushing on those. Two is, like I said, I think there's um, a lot to be said. I, I, I just, in my career, don't want to do any more litigation and only want to do litigation if it's partnered with an organizing and advocacy strategy, because I think there's more that you can accomplish in tandem, in coordination, strategically, than, than just in the courts. Um, and, and I think court cases can be a piece of that leverage, can be a media point, can be a um, a, a sort of an additional pressure um, to add on to, to what's possible through media and organizing. Um, and three, it's like we could change the laws. We could have a we could have a right to housing in this country if we um, if there is political will for it. I think um, it obviously exists in other countries. And so I think in addition to like let's remedy past harm, let's stop them from doing this, let's get an injunction. I think we as lawyers have to be where organizers already are, which is like we have to change the framework. We have to um, we have to join with folks who are calling for broad change um, in our laws so that we will have better tools when we go into court. And and also I I think it's important to realize too that aside from just doing litigation, there's like uh, we used to have a citation defense clinic. LA Ken still has it, and Elisa worked on it, and we created a training manual. So you need supervising attorneys to engage law students or to engage, um, you know, early first year new lawyers, like through the pro bono commitments that firms make. And they're usually stationed at the organizing places. So it gives you a direct connect with the organizing operating on a project that equals, or just recently in Portland, they created a hotline where when people are being swept, there's a hotline they can call. And one of the roles that RAP plays with the groups we work with, just like the homeless union does with their groups and the Poor People's Economic Human Rights Campaign does with their groups, 
is we share successes and we share failures and we share per project models. And having a hotline is something people have talked about for years. Now these guys have actually pulled it off and a homeless person calls, they're actually talking to a person <clears throat> and then developing a response network to it, whether there be legislative, legal or direct action, it doesn't matter. You respond to it in any way you can and that's where it's got to be an ongoing working together thing not we come to you because we're getting screwed over and then you go do your thing and we go back and do our thing that's 37 years man and we're talking about sweeps of people on the street come on if there isn't a call for organizing i mean covid really showed what how much the cops have been getting used and the bid security have been getting used to make people disappear. As soon as that pressure got released a little bit, all of a sudden cities are freaking out and vigilante groups and neighborhood associations are turning into vigilante groups because all these people are in the street. Those ain't new people in the street. We're gonna see that in a couple of months or a couple of weeks. Those are the people that were already there and that's what it looks like when you take the police enforcement out of the equation. Clearly, we need housing, and the pandemic showed that blatantly true. And Housing First is a scam. All this other crap is a scam. We need to restore project-based, permanently affordable housing for all people in our community. And there was actually a question about that, you know, I, I do want to talk about building a campaign from the ground up to get at some of the transformative change that we know needs to happen. Um, but Paul, you mentioned uh, uh, you mentioned housing first, and uh, there was a question about both how how somebody can tell the historical narrative and connect. And this is something that wrapped us very very well. You know, tell the story of how sweeps fit into a larger historical arc of discrimination and oppression and segregation um, that we're fighting through a number of different lenses, but is all part of, and parcel of um, a, a larger problem and how, uh, where you go um, from, from there. If it's not housing first, where is it? Well, it is housing first, but you gotta fund housing in your HUD budget. The fact that it's, it's a public relations campaign, it's not an actual program. And just like point in time headcounts don't tell you shit about how many unhoused people are in your community, housing first, the fact that it's in the homeless program tells you it's not a housing program. So you need to fund project-based permanent housing. The vouchers was a scam created when they were doing Hope 6, housing choice voucher. It's the choice of the landlord. It's not the choice of the person with the freaking voucher in their hand. No, just cut out all the BS and fund permanently affordable housing and HHS fund community-based residential treatment and then see how many homeless encampments you got in your community. because. Lord knows our DNA didn't change in 1982 when we decided it would be nicer to go sleep out in the freaking streets. So we already know that when the housing is available, people choose not to sleep in the freaking streets. So let's point, you know, that's the whole emphasis of without housing is cause and effect. What caused the opening of emergency shelter programs in the early 1980s? And in order to actually affect that, we have to we have to address that issue and that issue was usda and hud abandoning the pretext that housing for people that are poor is a responsibility of the federal government and uh, I, I, I would you just, mentioned just say one, one course, more thing sir. about, about the, the legal slash advocacy strategy uh when we decided to cut off relations with the uh communication with the city it, that came from the encampment residents. And when we also said, uh, do you fear the police uh, coming in and, and taking apart everything? Everybody said, bring it. Everybody was very clear about their position on that. And that, that means we had to turn our paternalistic hats off. Uh, the thing that told me I need to protect these groups of people from this, they are like, they almost to a person, they said, uh, I've been cleared out before. This is not the first time, nor will it probably be the, be the last. Um, or I'm not, I will not be moved. They were like, I will not be moving myself. 
no, somebody better be moving me, but I will not be moving. And that is what we've committed to them too. We will not be breaking down the, the better be someone else. Um, you know, and, and I just want to bring that to the, here where like we do deep listening constantly. I will be th at the encampment, just, I don't really have anything to do. I'll probably pick up some trash with some people and that is it. And we'll kind of talk to people and that's it. I'm just going to really try to like, uh, as and, and create as much equanimity as possible even though there's such vast power differentials it's basically our job to decrease those as much as possible thank you that's great sterling can you talk a little bit more about that because i think that's really critical so how how can we um, recognize and navigate the power differential and create a more equitable working space for everybody who's who's working in common together to stop these sweeps from I mean, so some of the strategies we have had have been to to have these direct actions and people get experience on a microphone. Um, if as time goes on, um, we've had uh, I can I can just give you the example of of our strategy the week leading up to the eviction. Uh, we had lawyers working on it, uh, which was very important. That that was going to be the the last resort, but. We had a, a press conference that got significant coverage on Monday with lots of residents speaking at it. Um, we had another direct action with, again, lots of residents speaking at it. Then Thursday, another press press conference where we were talking about the public health aspects of, of what was going on at the encampment. So it, we were just giving people, uh, I mean, this is what we wanted to do. People wanted to speak. It almost, and, and just in terms of like understanding the context of where we are, it, it then turns into a little bit of a, of a kind of a church vibe and music vibe. And all of a sudden it's kind of a party at like 10 a.m. in the morning, you know, so um, so that is the sort of thing. And then even when we uh, nothing, you know, nothing basically happened on the eviction day, we had a march to the northern north camp and everybody again, everybody spoke at this at this rally. A lot of Black Lives Matter people came as well. Well, so it's really just about creating opportunities for people to be able to speak. And also every time I'm speaking to somebody, as I try to like just stand, I try to pass on knowledge about like, how much money is in ESG, how much money is in CDBG, when is that money coming? Uh, what is, when we're talking about hotels, temporary hotels, like like how that money is reimbursed, like the rules around uh, and the vote that was done at the COC to say that those people that are in the hotel should be offered permanent housing people's right to re not to reject that permanent housing. Uh, you know, it's just about like transferring as much knowledge as possible so that now any any television news crew that goes to the camp encampment, uh, people are really prepared. I, I'm I, and I just pass on people's numbers and that's just the organizing that has to be done. Um, you don't need to. I mean, I'm speaking now, but you don't need to hear my voice constantly. And for folks who are our presenters, if you are interested in being contacted, because we have a number of uh, people just asking for your contact information or asking questions that I think would best be asked just directly of you, um, for example, about demands on websites, about um, using wrap artwork, um, if you can put your uh, contact information directly in the chat so that every audience member can get, get that, that would be great. Also, uh, when we go to the last slide, and feel free, Melissa, actually, to move us there so that people have our contact information as well. Um, you can reach out to us uh, that way. A couple, a couple of last questions in our final minutes here. Um, we've received, a, I'm collapsing a, a number of questions, but um, they all kind of speak to uh, private actors and their roles in sweeps. Um, so what we, what we of course know is that sweeps are, are primarily done by governmental actors, but not exclusively. There will be groups of vigilantes who will get together to come and raise encampments um, using uh, equipment that they have or just using terror tactics, you know, like burning, for example, encampments or cutting open tents. Uh, we know that um, uh, businesses and business improvement districts are drivers of criminalization policies and enforcement and displacement of people from certain locations. And we got a question about a group of residents in DC that offered a night uh, stay in a hotel and people who took them up on that offer found that when they returned to their encampment, all of those their possessions have been trashed um, and per the question, it looks like by the people who offered that one night stay in the hotel. Um, and so, you know, how, how do we address the, uh, the private accomplices um, in sweeps activities? 
Well, one is we could ensure that that our local governments no longer fund them because a lot of it is coming from funding from local governments. But I think it's even more important to, I mean, you look at the number of racist incidents that are happening across the country. I mean, we're, we've demonized homeless people for 37 years as their by choice, as drug addicts, as mentally ill, as anything but human being. We've pretty much called them everything. And you see the media demonizing them. And you see some nonprofits where the homeless people are always curled up little balls that need to be rehabilitated to fit back into society. The hell we ain't. We ain't that. And we see it on, on young kids of color being hearing in the media that they're always the target of something or other, or they did something or other. You, you think homeless people don't see that stuff? see the newspapers and hear the radio and see the TV, but they know it's not true about them. And the organizing is so vital because they need to recognize it's not true about your brothers and sisters either. That when we come together, we are powerful. And then if these guys want to be messing with us and we're all united, you know, good luck to them, brother, because we will fight back. But the first responsibility is to protect and defend. And that's, you know, the, the cops in Portland should be defending people from the federal troops, not working with the federal troops. The cops in, in San Francisco or anywhere should be defending people from vigilanteism and from private security and from business improvement districts. And they're not. They're doing dine and crime dinners with the Sacramento bid people. That's that's the shit that's got to stop. Yeah, I, from from our perspective, the strategy that we've been that we've um, implemented has been to reach out to people. We have a we have a multiracial group of people, which is helpful. Uh, I'm not sure I would want to do that, but there are people in our group that have reached out to some of the neighbors, um, and you know, we have been basically saying that this is a corruption story. The housing authority has spent $45 million on a headquarters instead of trying to clear its waiting list. The, the waiting list has been closed since 2013 and they sell off hundreds, uh, about uh, probably like about a thousand properties at least that we know of since uh, since 2013. And that's when it was um, taken out of receivership and given back to the authority of the people in Philadelphia. So um, we, we know that the CEO pays himself basic, basically about 200,000 more than the federal cap uh, um, kind of suggests, so that should be that a CEO should earn. I mean, there's this is really a corruption story, and and it it allows for so many people to 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 get on this uh, to get on this issue and to be directed. I mean, because they every this is everyone's issue. This is everyone's issue. If if we're not here, we're going to be somewhere else. So how about we try to solve this uh, in a in a permanent way? That's what we've been saying, and it's been quite it has been quite effective in terms of turning people from against us to on our favor, talking to the mayor, saying the same exact thing that we're saying. I, I, I am mindful of time, but I think there's one one last question that I think um, I'd like for us to, to discuss before we close. Um, and, you know, we're hearing from people in the question box about um, these very same things playing out in city across city. And I know that's not a surprise to, to anyone who is a, a panelist here and probably not to most of the audience members. Like, for example, um, Aaron Shaw talked about how what's going on in Philly mirrors exactly what's going on um, in Polk County, Florida right now. None of what we've discussed is unique to Philly, to San Francisco, to Denver or to Sacramento. Um, and it is um, always better, as Paul mentioned, when we join together and work together. And there's now the House Keys Not Sweep campaign, a national campaign that's been built from the ground up. Um, and if, if we can talk about how we can work together um, via that campaign or via any of the mechanisms that we can use such that we're not reinventing the wheels and fighting the same problems in isolation, but working collectively together as organizers, as lawyers, and across cities, uh, to achieve transform transformative change. Um, I'd love to, you know, end with that. I mean, anybody that's that's a fighter for human rights can is more than happy to get hooked up with, with rap in one way, shape, or form or another. And there is the homeless union, and there is the Poor People's Economic Human Rights Campaign, and there is the Poor People's um, Network. But 
you know, it's it's important to be doing something. And, you know, we, for a reason, have everything, our fact sheets, our research, our legislation, our, our artwork, everything is on our website and it's all free. You know, information is power and it shouldn't be a commodity. So, like, checking that stuff out, signing up for the newsletter, if you're into the way we do it, then hook up with us. If you're into a different way of doing it, then hook up with them. We're, we're, this isn't a competition. Nobody's looking to be the king of fighting sweeps. We're all fighting sweeps. The thing is that we do it with a human rights context and a social justice context, and we practice what we preach. If we say people, regardless of their housing status, deserve dignity and respect, we sure as hell better be treating them with dignity and respect because they're our community members and that's how we treat each other because that's how we build power. But we don't hide. We're really easy to find. Rap at raphome.org. Um, and, and anything that you need is that we have to offer is there. And as the campaign grows, we'll continue to share more of it. Thank you. Uh, Sterling or Elisa, do you, do you have anything to add? Okay. Well then I'll just, I'll add one thing. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's our pleasure at the Law Center to work with organizers and other stakeholders around the country. Um, and what I what I hope to leave as an impression with the audience today um, is that there are organizing campaigns that are informed by people experiencing homelessness that um, that need support. Um, they have demands. They know uh, people who are experiencing homelessness know what they need um, to to address the harms that they're facing and to um, improve the uh, the lives that they're living. Um, the law is an impediment to those types of um, progressive changes that we want to see, um, but lawyers cannot inside of legal offices uh, determine in isolation what progress looks like or how to get there. Um, there is a role for lawyers to play in it to uh, be supportive of these campaigns. I would call on every lawyer who's listening to this uh, webinar today uh, to use your resources, use your skills to support the advocacy efforts that you're hearing about uh, taking place through House Keys Not Sweeps campaign and through uh, Homeless Union campaigns and in your local community. Um, you've heard a number of tactics. Um, there are hotlines that can be uh, staffed. There are uh, tickets to be defended. There are tows of vehicle homes to be um, contested. There's property to be retrieved when it is uh, stored um, but unavailable to people who wish to seek it. There are suites to monitor, um, evidence to gather, and there are uh, you know, policies to advocate for that are informed by the people who know what policies they need um, and lawsuits to file um, should it come to that. Uh, and and I am available. Please do reach out. That is exactly what we're here to do and what we want to do. Thank you all so much for joining us for the full 90 minutes. Um, and go to our website, check out our resources, and we hope uh, that we'll be working together with you in the future. And thanks to our excellent panelists. This is great. Thank you all. Take care. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Have a good one.